previous videos, we have explained all ingredients of reaction transport modeling in porous media. Here, we will explain how this is done in practice using R and the package Reactran. We will use a relatively simple example and highlight the most important steps in the process of creating a one-dimensional reaction transport model. The skeleton of a one-dimensional reaction transport model has the following components. Definition of the spatial grid and any model parameters that may or may not vary in space. Definition and initialization of state variables. Definition of the model function, which includes calculation of the transport and reaction terms for each state variable and time derivatives. Calculation and plotting of the solution. And finally, a check of mass balances and construction of a budget. The most important functions that we will use in these steps are shown on the right. In the following, we will discuss them in greater detail using an example. First, we define a problem and the relevant state variables and processes that we are going to model, including their units. In this example, we consider a sediment in which particulate organic carbon is mineralized into dissolved inorganic carbon. Thus, our state variables will be the concentration of particulate organic carbon in the sediment and the concentration of dissolved inorganic carbon in the pore water. We denote them as POC and DIC. We aim to model this process in a sediment column down to a depth of 20 cm on a scale of days. Thus, the length will be in centimeters and time will be in days. We assume that the sediment porosity is decreasing exponentially with depth, starting from a value of 0.9 at the sediment water interface and reaching a value of 0.7 after about 5 cm. We describe this variation using the function shown in blue. Because POC is a part of the solid phase in the sediment, its concentration is in moles of carbon per cubic meter of solid. In contrast, the DIC concentration is in moles of carbon per cubic meter of liquid because it is a dissolved substance. In the second step, we define the rate expressions and mass balance equations. We assume that the POC mineralization is the only reaction in the model. We assume that it is a first order process with respect to POC. Thus, we express the mineralization rate as a product of a rate constant and the concentration of POC. In this example, we assume that the rate constant is equal to 0.01 per day. Because the mineralization rate is in moles of carbon per cubic meter of solid per day, it can be used directly in the mass balance equation for the POC concentration. In contrast, the mineralization rate needs to be modified by the factor of 1 minus porosity divided by porosity to obtain the rate of DIC production. This factor converts the units of the rate from moles of carbon per cubic meter of solid per day to moles of carbon per cubic meter of liquid per day, as required. Now, we consider the environmental setting and the corresponding transport processes and boundary conditions. We assume that the particulate organic carbon is mixed in the sediment due to bioturbation. The corresponding bioturbation mixing coefficient is 5 squared cm per year. In contrast, the dissolved inorganic carbon is transported in the sediment by diffusion. We assume that salinity is 35 and temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. At these conditions, the molecular diffusion coefficient of DIC is about 0.85 squared centimeter per day. The sediment is accreting at a rate of 0.005 centimeters per day. 
which corresponds to about 1.8 cm per year. The input of POC due to sedimentation is 200 nanomoles of carbon per square centimeter per day. This is a flux of POC that we impose at the upper boundary of the spatial domain. Finally, the DIC concentration at the sediment water interface is 2000 nanomoles carbon per cubic centimeter of liquid. This is a concentration that we impose at the upper boundary of the spatial domain. Now we are ready to implement the model in R. First, we divide the spatial domain into a grid. The grid length is 20 cm and it comprises 200 boxes. We emphasize that the grid is a central variable in the model. It describes all relevant locations in the spatial domain, including centers of the boxes as well as their interfaces. The grid can comprise equally sized boxes, as shown by the upper example. However, if we expect steep gradients close to the upper boundary, it is better to define a grid with an exponentially increasing size of the boxes, as shown by the lower example. Because we want the porosity to vary with depth, we first define a function that describes this variation. We do this for both the porosity and the solid volume fraction. Then we use this function to evaluate the porosity and solid volume fraction in every location of the grid. In a similar way, we evaluate the diffusion coefficient for the DIC. First, we use the function available in the package Maralac to find the molecular diffusion coefficient based on temperature and salinity. We assume that most of the DIC is in the form of bicarbonate and therefore choose the value for this DIC species. In the next step, we need to correct the diffusion coefficient for tortosity which we approximate using a formula based on porosity. Here, we emphasize that the diffusion coefficient is used to evaluate fluxes at the interfaces between the grid boxes. Therefore, the correction of the diffusion coefficient needs to be based on the porosity at the locations of the grid interfaces. Now, we define a factor of model parameters that are constant and do not need to be evaluated on the grid. They include the bioturbation mixing coefficient, the sediment accretion velocity, the mineralization rate constant, and finally, the POC flux and the DIC concentration at the sediment water interface. Now, it is time to define and initialize the state variables. In this model, we use two state variables, POC and DIC. However, these state variables are going to represent a spatial distribution of POC and DIC concentrations in the sediment. Therefore, each state variable is in fact a vector with 200 values. These values correspond to the concentration in the middle of the boxes defined by the grid. Because the function that is going to solve the model only accepts one vector as input for the state variables, we combine the two factors into one long vector. For two state variables and 200 boxes, the length of the vector is 400. The first 200 values correspond to the concentrations of POC, the second 200 values correspond to the concentrations of the IC. We note that the solver needs an initial distribution of the state variables to find the solution. In this example, we set the initial concentrations to zero for both state variables and throughout the entire spatial domain. Now, we are ready to define the model function. This is the part that calculates the time derivatives of the state variables depending on the rates of reactions and transport. Additionally, 
it is the place where boundary conditions are implemented. We emphasize that this function has three input parameters. Time, one long vector with the values of the state variables, and the vector with model parameters. Therefore, the first step in the model function involves extracting the individual state variables from that one long vector. As noted earlier, the first 200 values correspond to the concentrations of POC, the second 200 values correspond to the concentrations of DIC. In the next step, we implement the influence of transport for each component. To do this in 1D, we use the Reactram function trend1D. Essentially, this function calculates the transport term in the differential equation for a particular component. The transport term depends on the volume fraction, the diffusion-like mixing coefficient, and the velocity of the advective flow. Therefore, we use the values calculated earlier as input to this function. Note that for POC we use the solid volume fraction, which is equal to 1 minus porosity. Importantly, the trend1d function is also the place where boundary conditions constraining the given state variable are specified. For POC, we want to impose a flux at the upper boundary. Therefore, we set the input value flux up to a value that we specified earlier. For DIC, the transport term is slightly different. First, we want to impose the concentration at the upper boundary as the boundary condition. To do this, we set the input value C up to the DIC concentration in the overlying water. Additionally, we set the volume fraction to porosity, the diffusion coefficient to the tertiosity corrected value at the interfaces of the grid that we calculated earlier, and the advective velocity to the same value as for POC. Note that we did not specify any boundary conditions at the lower boundary. If we leave out a boundary condition, the boundary condition of zero gradient is assumed by default. In the next step, we calculate the process rates. Because in this simple model we only have one process, we only specify one rate. Clearly, multiple rate expressions need to be defined when modeling multiple processes. A critical point to note at this stage are the units of the rates. As mentioned earlier, POC in our model is in moles of carbon per cubic meter of solid. Therefore, the mineralization rate defined by this expression is in moles of carbon per cubic meter of solid per day. To finish the model function, we finally specify the time derivatives. As explained in another video, the rate of change for each state variable comprises two contributions one due to transport, and the other one due to the net rate of all reactions. For POC, the transport term was calculated earlier, and we extract it from the trend POC list using the $DC syntax. The net reaction rate for POC is equal to the negative of the mineralization rate calculated earlier. For DIC, the transport term is calculated analogously as for POC, using the trend DIC list calculated earlier and the $DC syntax. For the reaction rate, however, we need to be extra careful. This is because the mineralization rate is in moles of carbon per cubic meter of solid per day but we need a value that is in moles of carbon per cubic meter of liquid per day. To make this conversion, we use the factor 1 minus porosity divided by porosity. Note that the porosity values need to be evaluated in the center of the grid boxes. In the last step, 
we specify the output of the model function, which are the time derivatives of the state variables. Note that we again combine them into one long vector. Here, one needs to be careful to combine the state variables in the same order as they are extracted at the beginning of the model function. Note that it is often useful to output additional variables from the model function. For example, to aid interpretation of the results, it is useful to output the mineralization rates along the spatial domain. Similarly, to be able to check the mass balances and construct the total carbon budget, it is useful to output the depth integrated rate of mineralization and the fluxes of POC and DIC at the domain boundaries. Once the model function, model parameters, and the initial values of the state variables have been specified, the steady state solution is found using the steady 1D function from the Reactrend package. Here, we note an important parameter called positive. Because the state variables in our models are concentrations, they cannot be negative. To force the solver to only find a positive solution, we set the parameter pos to true. After the solution is found, it can be easily plotted using the plot function. Note that in the plot function, we can specify how we want the graphs to look like. For example, we can swap the x and y axis, specify which output variables should be displayed, etc. Using the depth integrated process rates and the fluxes at the domain boundaries, we can construct a total carbon budget for the sediment column. This budget can be depicted in a conceptual diagram, as shown on the bottom. If the mass balances in the model are correct, the incoming and outgoing fluxes for each component should add up to zero. The dissolve package, which is loaded together with the React Trend package, offers functions for calculating dynamic solutions. For a one-dimensional model, dynamic solutions are found using the ODE1D function. The result can be displayed, for example, as an image, with time shown on the x-axis, depth shown on the y-axis, and the concentrations shown in colors. We conclude that if you follow the generic steps described in this video, the development of a one-dimensional reaction transport model with the R package Reactran is rather straightforward. It will be even easier if you start your coding using the template that accompanies this video. The template is free to use and expand based on the needs of your model.